10 minutes. He said, that 10 minutes more than I got to. <laughs> Tonight we're going to talk about a 2017 Jewish year 5778 tale of two winter holidays. Now back uh, in the uh, uh, spring of the year we talked about the uh, tale of two holidays. We talked about uh, Passover and Easter. Uh, or Resurrection Sunday, I prefer to call it. Uh, tonight we're going to look at um, Christmas and we're going to look at uh, Hanukkah and a little bit about uh, what Hanukkah is all about. Uh, so we're looking at, uh, again, we, so, some folks might refer to it as Christian holiday and a Jewish holiday. But uh, we're going to, we're, I'm, I'm hoping that by the time we finish tonight we're going to be saying, why are we Christians not celebrating this? <laughs> but to tell about two winter holidays, Happy Hanukkah and Merry Christmas from Brumley's Department Store where shopping is king. Right. <laughs> hey, I'm even impressed with the uh, with the window display down at Oak Shields. <laughs> It's going to be Tuesday evening when the first uh, the, the kindling of the first lights, and it will run through uh, December the uh, 19th. Uh, Hanukkah is an eight-day or eight-night celebration, uh, beginning in the Jewish calendar, uh, Keshlev, the 25th, and we'll find out why it's an eight-day uh, celebration here in just a little while. But the first story that I would like to talk about tonight and the tale of two uh, winter holidays, the first story will be about Christmas and the... Uh, you'll see over here we have the nativity I asked the ladies this morning if they would leave this up oh thank you thank you thank you I, God gave Adam a, a, a helpmate for a reason I, poor old Adam I mean, he was lost out there in the, in the garden uh, by, all by himself until, until he had some, how many men do we have in the house uh, the men um, I need, I need uh, uh, all, all the men that can, uh, can help me out in just a minute. I need, I, I need brethren, I need y'all up here. up here. I need the men, men of Living Branch uh, uh, Men's Ministry. I need busy men in the house that would like to uh, uh, help out with this. Can certainly come up. and Pastor, I'm going to put you over here by yourself. We're going to single the pastor out here for just a moment. Now, not too far away. Not too far away. Um, <laughs> We, we, we the, uh, the men of uh, the, uh, the men's ministry, Living Branch Ministries, and, and uh, Brother Brian asked if I would uh, stand in beha uh, his behalf tonight to do this because in his absence. Uh, we talked about when we were going to do this, and we said tonight would be a good time, but he was not going to be able to be here. He wanted to be here, but he asked me to stand in, uh, in uh, his behalf. Uh, we have a presentation uh, from the uh, men's ministry of the church for our pastor. We want to say, Pastor, Merry Christmas. Reach in and get get the snake and pull him on out and around the congregation. <laughs> He's long, isn't he? <laughs> okay. And unwrap. Go ahead and unwrap that. Now that's, yeah, that's in the sheath. Okay. <laughs> 
I, the, uh, I believe the song says something other about uh, the song. Will you ride with him? Says something about he'll uh, ride with a sword by his side. Anybody have a pocket knife? I, ha I left mine at home. Here we go. Here, a real man carries a pocket knife. Hey, you got real men up here. Green. <laughs> Uh, Green Greenville County will not let me carry a pocket knife. The reason Greenville County will not let me carry a pocket knife is they know I'm going to up and cut myself. They're going to have to send out they're going to, have to send out EMT technicians. They're going to have to get me over to the hospital, and they just said it just it makes a bloody mess. They don't just rather I don't carry a knife. So that's why I don't have one. That's the knife to save, to save your pork, is all I'm going to say. Don't cut yourself. <laughs> yes. It's coming out of this, out of the, okay. Yeah. Now, you see the, the, the inscription should be on one side here. Okay. Oh, it's on, it's on the sheet. It's on the sheet. Yeah. Oh, you need to cut that plastic. <laughs> can you see? Can, can y'all see the brass handle? I thought that was very pretty. Uh, the the uh, men of uh, the men's ministry all pitched in together. We we, uh, we took up a little offering. We all pitched in together. Um, I found uh, where we could order these. We could not just run out and buy them. We had to order them. I found a place to order them. Got them ordered and everything. Uh, all the men uh, pitched in to help pay for it. And uh, <laughs> That's talk to Amazon. That's, that's what we call the men up here to get it unwrapped. How many men does it take to unwrap a Christmas present? <laughs> Up here. <laughs> <laughs> let me let, let me see if I can. Amen. Why tonight our Christmas present? It'd be Christmas by the time we get this thing unwrapped. <laughs> <laughs> we almost there, y'all. You're live on the internet. <laughs> oh, Lord. We really get close now. Oh, Woo. Close. okay. Oh, it's, it's oily. It's oily. Okay. Um, I don't have on my reading Where's glasses. Where's your glasses? <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> oh my lord. <laughs> 
I can look at this word from, and you know what conclusion I always come up with? She was a virgin. <laughs> I, I have looked at uh, definitions that try to say that she was a young girl. Doesn't fit. Doesn't fit. Uh, it says that uh, she, she is a virgin. And that's a, that's a very important point about the whole Christmas story. Because if Mary was not a virgin, we don't have a Christmas story. This had to be a very unique birth. There are some that believe that the Immaculate Conception was when Mary was born, that Mary was born without sin so she could be the mother of the Christ child. If, I were on a TV, if this were a TV game show and someone gave that answer, I could hear the buzzer going off now. <laughs> the sinless birth was in only one, and that was Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah, our Messiah, because our Creator has came to be our Savior. That is the important point I want to make tonight is our Creator has become our Savior. Verse 32. Somebody read for me verse 32. Chapter 1, verse 32. Man should be called the son of the most high. Now we're going to get a little bit of a Hebrew lesson here for a moment. Look at the person beside you or a person behind you or in front of you, somebody close by, and I want you to say to them, Hop in Elohim. You just said he is the son of God. Now look at them again and say to them, Hop in Elion. You have just said that he is the son of the Most High. Amen. That, that is the second point that I want to uh, uh, make here tonight. That Mary was a virgin and that Jesus was the son of the Most High. Isaiah chapter 5 verses 6 and 7 tells us that uh, 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 there shall be no end to his kingdom. That is a beautiful prophecy to me because there would be no end to his kingdom. He um, selected his uh, Talmudim, his uh, Talmudim, I'm sorry, his Talmudim, his disciples. He carefully selected uh, the group that would be his inner circle around him. He trained them to go out and to, uh, to tell the gospel good news uh, of his, uh, uh, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, the ascension uh, back uh, to heaven and to tell the world that he's coming back again. He's coming back. But he said of the, uh, of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Two, some 2,000 years later, here we are this evening sitting in a building where we, thank God, have uh, the liberty and the freedom to come and worship openly like this in a public setting. We don't have to hide in catacombs. We don't have to go uh, in, uh, in some cave somewhere uh, in, uh, in hopes that we don't get uh, found and we don't get caught uh, trying to assemble to worship. We have, we're privileged people. We have this liberty that God has given us. And there are many that would like to take that away from us. Uh, one of the amazing things was that uh, for 70 years in the Soviet Union where people were hiding to uh, uh, have a church, 70 years later when all of a sudden they could come out of hiding and start worshiping openly and America said, oh, we've got to get our missionaries over there now so we can teach these people about what the Word of God says. For 70 years, uh, you know, they, they, they've been denied access to the Word of God. Well, the missionaries get over there. And I got to talk with one of those missionaries. And he said, we got over there and those folks knew every bit as much as we did about the Bible. <laughs> and he said, we asked him, who told you this? Who, who told you these things? And they said, we have the same Bible you have. Just ours is written in Russian and yours is written in English. But now what they would do, they would get a Bible. Oh, I have a Russian Bible, a Russian book of, of uh, John. It's not the entire Bible. It's a book of John in the Russian language. I have one at home. They would take the Bible and they would take and they would tear a page out. And I'm thinking, tear no page out of my Bible. 
But they would take it and tear a page out. One person would take that page home with them and they would memorize that page. After they memorized that page, they gave that page, now this is my shopping list, brother. It says, you know, probably dishwasher liquid, no tell what on there. Then they would give that list to somebody else who would memorize it. Then they would pass it on to another. And whenever uh, that there was a, a person that would come into their meetings and would be saved, they would go and tell someone else from maybe another congregation where they knew that they could trust this person. There was a flower planted in whatever town they were from. There was a flower planted in Cash Lab Sunday. And that person would say, wonderful, good. And they would know, a person just got saved in Cash Lab last week. <laughs> if a family came in, they might go and tell... We received a bouquet of flowers at Cash Lab last week. But when missionaries arrived, they discovered, hey, these folks, I mean, these were Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized folks speaking in tongues. And they asked, them, who taught you about this? They said, the same Holy Ghost that taught you. <laughs> I might need that piece of paper back. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything else on there or not. But i got to go buy a store and get this dishwashing liquid, this margarine in a little while. <laughs> Man, to be saying, where do you want to what you do my shopping list? I gave it to Dana. <laughs> but of the increase of his kingdom, there shall be no end. 2,000 years later, his kingdom is still spreading. We are still telling folks about the good news of our, of our Creator. Yes, go ahead and give Him some praise in the house. Of our Creator who came. Yes, give Him some praise in the house. Our Creator who came in the humble form of a baby. Why did He come in the humble form of a baby? Because if He came in as a mighty general or as a king, we'd be afraid of Him. Oh my goodness. we back away. How many in here? Raise your hand. How many in here are afraid of babies? I'm afraid I might have changed their diaper. I might have to clean them up a little bit. Nobody in here is afraid of a baby. He came in a way that we would receive him. He didn't. He wasn't born in the palace. And I can imagine since Joseph, you know, he, he was a carpenter. He probably, you know, he made a little bit of money. He was you know, uh, uh, probably a self-employed carpenter. Uh, he, so he, he probably, I can see all the way uh, as Mary's riding on that donkey trying to get into Bethlehem. I can almost see, now this is not scripture. This is straight out of the book of Kenneth. Uh, I can see that, that jo Joseph is telling her, honey, when we get to town, I'm going to get you a really nice, comfortable room in the inn. When we get there, don't worry, I've got the money bag here. We're going to get us a room. And, I'll, and you can have that baby in a nice, comfortable uh, inn. They get there, no vacancy. Jacob about burnt the house down one night. He set the top bunk on fire. He was trying to burn a string that was hanging down in his face. It's midnight. He's not in here to defend himself, is he? And so his idea... I don't know where he, I don't, it, uh, it, it can't be hereditary. I don't know where he gets it from. But his bright idea was to set the string on fire. You know, strike like a match. Whatever. Set the string on fire. And when the string burned to the blanket that was hanging down from the top bunk, no one was on the top bunk. I don't even know why I had bunk beds. No one slept up there. He did occasionally. When the string would get up to the blanket that it was attached to, he would blow the flame out. Well, what he didn't understand was as soon as the flame hit the blanket on the top bunk above him, the flame was going to go in all kinds of directions. The only thing I heard was his little sister while she's doing up watching television at midnight. Before I don't know, but sometimes I'm going to say, thank God she's up. She's on her, fire, fire, real fire, real fire. Well, the smoke alarm goes off. I'm running in there, and sure enough, his, the top bunk is on fire. And the room is so full of black smoke. We get the fire out. I had to break a window and throw the, the, the garden hose. That's right. I didn't say hose pipe. <laughs> I had to get the garden hose in the, uh, in the back window. And I'm in there like a fireman fighting fire. I mean, I'm spraying all over the place. Blacked up his walls, his ceiling, everything. We get the fire out. But the house by this time, 
black smoke is rolled through the house. The whole house smells like smoke. You can't stand to stay in there. I've got to go. I, I, I said, well, it's going to take us several days to get this mess cleaned up. And we open the doors. Somebody called the police because of so much commotion going on. Police show up. <laughs> night. That was a, oh, I'm sorry, wait a minute. That was a silent night. And I had to tell the police, we got it under control. My grandson said his bed on fire. <laughs> but the fire is out. He said, do we need to call the fire department? No, sir, I believe everything's under control now. The bed's dripping with water. It's not going to catch back on fire. I got to replace the window. I broke a window out to try to get in there to get the fire put out. So here we got all this mess, and uh, we sent Jacob and Sarah to Teresa's house to spend the rest of the night. Here it is, 2 a.m. by this time. Amanda and I, we said, we can't sleep here. You can't breathe in here. It smells so bad of smoke. And so we said, well, we'll just go get us a, a, a you know, motel, hotel room for the rest of the night. We went all over Greer. Everything we kept seeing was no vacancy, no vacancy, no vacancy. <laughs> So we said, well, let's ride over to Greenville. We got over to Greenville. Here it is going on 3 o'clock in the morning. No vacancy, no vacancy. I went in two or three places. They said, we don't have any rooms. Found out there was how many of the three different sports events going on in Greenville that weekend. And, there was no, and I said, well, where, where, where do I have to go to get a room? They said, Asheville or Columbia. I felt like Joseph in Bethlehem. There was no room in the inn. All of that story about Jacob sitting in his bed on fire just to tell you what it's like to, for there to be no room in the inn. So all of a sudden, here's, here's Mary possibly already going into early uh, labor pains. Uh, contractions may have already, st uh, already started. And he said, man, we ain't got no rooms. There ain't no vacancy here tonight. We've got everybody coming in and pay them taxes. Get that census taken care of. So they get sent out to a cave of a thing. Dug out in a place in the, in, in the, uh, back in the bank of the uh, hillside where they kept the animals. And that's where our Savior was born. I am not going to go into to, to describing my childhood, but folks, I can relate with poverty. And I can tell you one thing, and I know about poverty having grown up in it, it hurts. It hurts. I'll just leave it with that for right now. And then when we get down to verse 34 and verse 35, again, it says Mary was a virgin. So if anybody wants to read 34, 35, help yourself. Go right ahead. I'll let you read it. If anybody has that and wants to read it. If, if, if not, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and move on. I like verse 37. This is what Gabriel said to Mary in verse 37. For with God... Quote that with me. For with God, nothing is impossible. <clears throat> but our Creator has become our Redeemer. We find Mary's song, chapter 47, I'm sorry, ch chapter 1. Mary's song, chapter 1, verses 47 through 55. Where, um, Mary just, I mean, she's just overwhelmed. I mean, you know, uh, this angel has came and told her that she's going to have a baby. And she said, how could this be? I'm a virgin. And the angel said, that ain't impossible. God, God's got this, honey. He can do this. <laughs> I mean, God's got this thing uh, taken care of. And she said, well, I'm down with that. <laughs> and 2,000 years later, there's no end to his kingdom. But we still talk, our teenagers still talk that way. But the Christmas story we find in, in uh, Luke chapter 2, we're all, we're all quite familiar with the story. Mary, whose name in, uh, in Hebrew is Miriam. Miriam. I met an um, Islamic young lady a few days ago whose name was Miriam. And what she said to me, I mean, I could you could have, you'd have to pick me. I mean, I, 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 they probably had to pick me up off the floor because of what Miriam, this is this uh, Muslim girl, said to me. She said, "I have the same name that Jesus' mother had." <laughs> I said, "Amen, sister." She said, "Jesus' mother's name was was Miriam, and his father in the Hebrew, his name was Joseph. 
Miriam and Yosef. And here a few years ago, right here in this sanctuary, in this church, I had the privilege of performing a wedding ceremony for Mary and Joseph. The groom's name was Joseph, the bride's name was Mary. <laughs> that was 2009, and it was Christmas time. It was, I think, in December when Mary and Joseph got married right here. <laughs> yeah, 2009. Those kingdoms should be no end. Born in a city uh, that we call Bethlehem, Bethlehem. The birth of Yeshua, Jesus. The shepherds. Now, a point here about the shepherds that were spending the night in the fields. This could not have occurred in December in the uh, Hebrew month of uh, Keshvev because it would have been too cold for shepherds to have been out there at night. So, it's okay that he was not born in December. Because I don't think that the Lord is going to be offended at whenever we celebrate the, the fact that our Creator has become our Savior and our Redeemer. It's something we should celebrate all year long. The Bible does not tell us specifically when or what month He was born. Um, I, I was... Um, Several years ago, I was getting ready to leave the state of South Carolina. I accepted a, uh, a church to pastor in the state of Mississippi. And uh, we didn't know how long we would be going, how many years we would be out there. And my wife's family got together. And her birthday is in January. It's coming up January 4th. Did I mention Manna's birthday is January 4th? Uh, that's coming up right after Christmas. Her birthday is January 4th, if I didn't mention it. <laughs> But uh, her family got together. It's June. We're getting ready to move to Mississippi. Her family got together and gave her an unbirthday party. Were you offended? <laughs> Did that hurt your feelings? I don't think Jesus is offended or it hurts his feelings for us to celebrate his birthday in a month other than the month he was actually born. So, I mean, right now, if you go to my house, you're going to find a Christmas tree. And next week you'll find half my living room is going to be green and white and the other half is going to be uh, blue and white. <laughs> uh, red and green, I'm sorry. One half is going to be red and green. The other uh, side is going to be uh, 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 blue and white. Christmas and Hanukkah going on at the same time. <laughs> you'll find a Christmas tree in one corner and you'll find a menorah in the other corner. <laughs> but he wasn't born in December, but that's okay. This was... Most likely, most likely he was born the first night of Sukkot, which would have been uh, in the uh, uh, month of Tishri, which would have been probably in the month of October. The shepherds would have been out in the fields keeping watch over their flocks by night in September or October, uh, the, uh, the last grazing before the uh, winter season. But one thing I like is what the angels sang. They sang peace, peace on earth. Peace on earth. In the language of the shepherds, they sang Shalom, Shalom Be'eretz, peace on earth. To the Greeks, and, the, and Greek was the, uh, the common language that, uh, that the empire spoke uh, at that time, they would have said uh, uh, Irene, peace. For Spanish-speaking folks, and I was kind of hoping we'd have one or two of our Spanish folks uh, here tonight, but those who understand Spanish uh, know that the word is Pas, P-A-S, pronounced pas. And if you want to, okay, how do you say that word pas? It's like an opossum. <laughs> Y'all know where possum kingdom is? <laughs> it's an <a> possum. <laughs> and uh, and the French is simply pay, peace. We pronounce it pay, like P-A-Y. Spelled P-A-I-X, pronounced pay. But the important thing in whatever language... Whatever language on earth is spoken, the shepherds sing peace on earth. Peace on earth. Shalom. Be'eretz. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. Peace toward men of goodwill. Peace on earth. What a beautiful expression of this season that we celebrate. What a beautiful expression. That's our prayer. That's what we want to see. When will we see peace? 
when Shiloh comes. Who is Shiloh? When the Lord returns. And He's coming back. On a, on a, when He brings peace, He's coming to, to destroy that that causes war, that that brings war, that that brings destruction. He, he comes to, to, uh, to destroy all of that program, but He comes with that sword by His side. <laughs> Go ahead and look at that sword. He comes with that sword by His side. And He's coming not to bring war. He's coming to establish peace. When will there be peace? When Messiah comes and He sets up His thousand year reign here on earth, there will be peace on earth. That's when, uh, uh, that's when uh, our, our swords will be beat into plowshares. So we've got a couple of plowshares up here. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry, what was that? <laughs> okay. Amen. <laughs> now the second story, the second story that we want, that we want to talk about tonight is Hanukkah. And whoa, yes. I want to look at a verse of scripture here for just a moment. John, book of John. Not first, second, or third, but the book of John we call St. John, chapter 10. Whoever has that in your, in your King James Bible, I would like for someone in the King James Bible to read that because I'm looking at the Jewish Bible and I want to read this to you in the Jewish Bible. What verse? John, chapter 10, verse 22. All right, go ahead and read that. Okay, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. It was the Feast of Dedication, and it was winter. Jesus had told you know, his disciples, "You know, you go on, you go on. I'm going to, I, I'll come along later." But he went up to Jerusalem uh, for the uh, Feast of Dedication. The Jewish Bible reads John ten twenty two. Then came Hanukkah. Now, to begin with, what does the word Hanukkah mean? Hanukkah means dedication. The feast of Hanukkah was a feast of actually was a rededication of the temple, but it means a feast of dedication, which, in, which as we have just mentioned, is a, a, a dedication or rededication of the temple. Now, how many temples are in this sanctuary right now? Look around at how many temples are in here. Thank you, thank you. How many did you count? Seventeen temples in here. Thank you, brother, for counting those. Uh, I, when he started counting, I said, he's got it. He's got it. He knows what I'm talking about. He's got it. Now, if, 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 if it's a time of, of dedication of the temple or a time of rededicating the temple, I'm knocking on that window again. At, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm knocking on that glass. Oh, let me go up here and knock on my glass window. <laughs> to me, that's a time of rededication of the temple. This temple. This temple in here, where the Holy Spirit dwells. Do you know? And the Scripture said, "Hey, don't you know your body is a, is a temple of the Holy Spirit?" Then came Hanukkah in Jerusalem. Now, what in the world is Jerusalem? It's Jerusalem, and it was winter. So when Jesus went up to Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication. Uh, he was going up uh, for, for you know to to go celebrate Hanukkah. So Jesus celebrated Hanukkah, and if there's no other reason for me to, I'm not telling you church you have to do this, but if there's no reason, uh, no other reason for me to want to celebrate uh, Hanukkah, I do it because my Savior done so. It's what the Lord done. So I want to. I, 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 I want to do. I want to be interested in what he was interested in. Now we're going to look at it here just in a moment. What. Uh, why the Feast of Hanukkah? What the celebration was all about? What were they commemorating? And uh, I have a couple of coins in my pocket. Hanukkah commemoration coins from Israel. These were supposed to be up there with Benjamin. Benjamin is the little bear sitting up here with his book of uh, Psalms and his little trail. Now he has a couple of uh, coins to go with his trail. Those are, are uh, Hanukkah uh, commemoration coins from Israel. Now, some of the 
things that they do. Of course, we we did not go into all the games and the food and everything associated with Christmas because we know those. We we, we know that we have to eat a, a, a fruit cake and we have to drink eggnog. If you don't, if you don't eat fruit cake and drink eggnog, you're communist. I mean, that's, that's something wrong. <laughs> I actually look forward to this time of the year. I get some eggnog. I have to do sugar-free eggnog, though. I make my own sugar-free eggnog at home. But the food and games, you know, of course, you know, there's a little dreidel game that the kids play with a little spinning top. Now, what I like about this little spinning top game, why I would even mention it in the first place, the little alphabets on the little dreidel top. I'll pass this around. Let's take a look at it. these alphabets are an acronym in the Hebrew language that means a miracle happened there. In Israel, there is one letter different. Ours simply means a, a, a miracle happened there. In Israel, it, it reads, the acronym says, a miracle happened here. The only difference, there's one letter difference in the, uh, in the uh, dreidels in Israel from the dreidels around the rest of the world. This one says, a miracle happened there. And uh, pass it around. They spin the little top, and whatever, and they have these little chocolate coins usually. Each child starts with the same number of chocolate coins. They spin the little top, and whatever letter, Hebrew letter it lands on, tells them whether they have to share the chocolate with the other players, throw a piece of chocolate in the, in the uh, um, pile in the middle of the table, uh, get half of the pile in the middle of the table, or by golly, get the whole, get the whole uh, uh, pile. <laughs> That's what, that's what I like. So I want mine to land on Gimel because when it lands on Gimel, that just means give me. <laughs> I got Gimel. Give me the, give, give me the pot. <laughs> mine. But now at the end of the game, normally at the end of the game, they, the children all share and disperse out the candy. So when the game's over, everybody ends up with an equal number of pieces of candy again. But whoever ended up with the most pieces of chocolate coin candy is the winner at the end of the game. And that is the game of dreidel. If you take the new... Now, you, uh, I think we've mentioned this before. And I'm having to say a lot, a lot of things tonight with the assumption that you're already aware of some of these things. In the Hebrew language, every letter of the alphabet has a numerical value. If you take the letters on the dreidel and you add up the numerical value of all the letters, it is the same numerical value of the word Messiah. Other uh, now, some of the foods that they uh, eat, and uh, I think one that everybody likes is jelly-filled donuts. That is a Hanukkah favorite because of the use of oil. You eat a lot of oily, a lot of fatty foods. You get to get by with eating fatty foods, uh, oily stuff. I mean, they, they go through some donuts. Uh, another thing that they eat, which would also involve an oily food, is they make this little potato cake and they deep fry it in oil. But the oil has to be kosher. It can't be lard. Lardy, lardy. It can't be lard. It's got to be kosher. Uh, the donuts are, are, are usually fried in, in, uh, and uh, deep fried in, in uh, oil. Um, those having to do you know, with the idea of the oil that we're going to look at in a moment. Nine branch menorah, or candelabra, as some call it, uh, the, uh, our, our King James Bible calls it calls a uh, candlestick, but in the King James, you'll see talk about a seven branch candlestick. Normally, when you see a menorah, it normally has seven branches. Someone mentioned that uh, just a little while ago as to why that this one has nine branches. Well, you got two two branches, too many on here. Uh, now, come um, Passover, I will remove. The two outer branches probably take out this cross, drop it down a level, and it'll be a seven-branch menorah. This one is adjustable. I can I can make it either way I want to. Uh, but why but why this one has nine branches? Nine-branch menorah is only used during Hanukkah. The rest of the year, they use the seven-branch menorah, which we have one in the vestibule out here, a little seven-branch menorah on the table, uh, which is what you normally see. But only during Hanukkah uh, do they use the nine-branch, and we're fixing to see why here in just a moment. On the first night, the very first light, light that is kindled, now these are you know, battery-powered, so uh, uh, 
will not be lighting any flames or anything. No candle wax to drip on the carpet like what happened a few years ago. Now on Tuesday night, they will light the shamash to begin with. Now, where you use candles, of course the shamash is lit first. I know it's dark here, you can't see that that light is on now. Uh, the shamash is raised up above the rest of the uh, lights, and you notice it has a little bit fancier, a little bit nicer glow. Thank you. Um, it's elevated because, according to um, Isaiah chapter 11, the shamash represents from the seven spirits of, of God, the shamash represents the spirit of the Lord. So it's elevated. That's why it's lifted up higher level than the other lights because it represents the spirit of the Lord. Now with candles, you would take the shamash and then you would go down and you would light the next light. On the first night, you would light the shamash and the first light. This will happen Tuesday evening. I'm kind of jumping ahead here. And then the, the uh, second night, you would begin by lighting the shamash and then you would come down and light number one, number two. And that would, that would progress each evening. You would take the, light the shamash first and then you go one, two, three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five. On down into the last eighth night of a Hanukkah, all the lights would be burning. But you're starting with the shamash because the shamash the Spirit of the Lord gives light and gives light to the other candles. Now we kind of represent the Shemash in the way that He told us to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So our light should show in a way that people should see the, uh, the light in us. We, so in that way, we become somewhat of the Shemash. But the Shemash represents the Lord. Now, there is a, Brother Donnie and Sister Dana got to see it. They were over in uh, Jerusalem, the big giant uh, menorah in the uh, acrylic uh, case. They got a picture of it in Pastor Donnie's office. The belief is that when the, when the true Messiah comes, he will light that menorah. And they will know he is the Messiah when he lights the menorah. I believe when Jesus, oh glory, I feel those goosebumps. I believe when he comes back, Oh, on that great white horse when he rides into, into uh, Jerusalem he's going to make a momentary stop whew, and it's going to light and he's going to ride on there and say this is the Messiah the gateway coming into Jerusalem uh, there was a uh, general no, it wasn't Allenby. It was a general, uh, right after Allenby had said that the, uh, a few years later, said the gateway was too, too narrow for him to ride his, his horse through there. So he wanted to maybe enlarge everything to where he could ride his horse through there. Well, that's okay because Jesus is going to ride his through there too. <laughs> he came in with all the pomp and everything, you know, make it all fancy and everything today. Mercedes Benz and BMWs drive through that gateway. I'm going to skip the next little portion here because I want to get to something a little bit more, more relevant for tonight's lesson because I'm running out of time. Why are there nine branches on the Hanukkah, the nine branch candelabra? Uh, because it is a, a, an eight-night eight, eight festival and we're fixing to find out why. It is also called the Festival of Lights. James 1 and 17 talks about uh, every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of Lights, the Father of Lights, the Father of Hanukkah. Um, John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus spoke to, to them again, and he said, I am the light of the world. Whosoever follows me will not have to walk in darkness, but will have light, because I give light. John 10, 22, we read that one a while ago. He went up to, to the Feast of Dedication. Uh, John 1, 17. John 1, 17. If I have the right chapter here. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through. Grace and truth, the light. 
grace and truth came through Jesus the Messiah. Matthew 5.16 talks about those who sat in the regions of darkness and great light has come. So for the Beast of Dedication, about, 20, about 2,957 years ago, or this was in the year 940, if you want to say B.C., I'm okay with that. If you want to say 940 B.C.E., I'm okay with that too. From 1 Corinthians chapter chapter 7, uh, 5, I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles, let me get my scripture right here. From 2 Chronicles chapters 5 through 7 was the dedication of the first temple, Solomon's temple it sometimes is called. About uh, 2,427 years ago, or 410 uh, B.C.E., and uh, Ezra chapter 7 and 11 was the rebuilding of the second temple. This is where um, I, I, after the, the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians and uh, the walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt by, ne uh, by Nehemiah, Nehemiah and Ezra comes in, they rebuild the temple, they rededicate the temple. 21882 uh, years ago, about the year 165 B.C. or B.C.E., was the rededication after the Maccabean re, uh, revolt, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Then in John 10:22, uh, Jesus comes along and uh, and celebrates Hanukkah at the uh, temple in Jerusalem. It's a time of personal and a time of family rededication. Also, dear. Uh, 1917. Dana talked, Sister Dana talked about this morning the Ottoman Empire and all the territory they controlled at the end of the war, the uh, uh, land that was promised to Israel. That uh, took place, uh, the uh, surrender took place on the second day of uh, Hanukkah that year. But due to the commercialization of Christmas and bobbing gift exchange, many Jewish families in our time have also begun to exchange gifts, particularly giving gifts of toys and games, electronics, etc. to their children at Hanukkah. But remember, the greatest gift that was ever given to mankind was when, was when our God, because of His love, gave His only and unique Son to, be a, to a sin-cursed world so that we... So that everyone who trusts in Him may have eternal life instead of being utterly destroyed. I want to go back to why are we? Why the eight days of uh, of Hanukkah? After about, just kind of get a little note here. Too. After about 157 years of conflicts, wars going on in what we call the Holy Land between the Greeks, the Egyptians, and the Syrians, all wanting to gain, gain control over that land. This was called the crossroads uh, of, the, of the world. This was the, the, the uh, trade routes all passed through uh, Jerusalem, passed through the Holy Land uh, from, uh, from every, every place that, uh, on earth at that time. But Antiochus IV, who had coins made with his picture on them and called himself Epiphanes the, uh, the Great One, came to power about the year uh, 168, and his first intent was to eradicate Judaism, get rid of the religious order in Jerusalem and, and all, all, all the land of Judea. They wanted to wipe out Judaism, which that is the roots of our Christianity. Without Judaism, Christianity has no roots. And without Christianity, Judaism has no branches to produce fruit. I said it anyway. <laughs> he wanted to establish pagan worship to Zeus. Zeus was the, uh, the, the, uh, the highest one of the Greek gods. They, had mon they were monotheistic. They had many, many gods. Zeus was their, their top dog god. And Zeus, you see him as a, the forging, uh, having somebody forge lightning bolts so he could sling lightning bolts down at people on earth. You've probably seen that in the movie Fantasia. That was not God in that movie Fantasia. And that movie was called Jupiter because Jupiter and Zeus were the same being. He was Jupiter in, in, uh, in uh, Latin. He was Zeus in Greek. 168 B.C., Antiochus came in with his mercenaries, defiled the temple in Jerusalem, and this was in the month of uh, Kishlet, and uh, they offered a pig, a sow, 
on the altar, on the brazen altar in Jerusalem, the altar where the where the lamb was supposed to be was supposed to be slain and offered to God, the altar where the bulls, the goats were brought, but never, never was a pig ever supposed to be brought to that altar. Pigs were looked at as something nasty, something that was unclean. Those were the things you know, that, uh, that, uh, that was lowered down in the, in the big sheet and Peter was told to kill them and eat them. Peter says, there are pigs on there, Lord. I'm not eating, killing and eating those things. Those are hogs. But Jews do not eat pork. They see, and, and, and if you go back in the uh, uh, Old Testament, uh, the uh, Torah the laws told them not to. That, was, that didn't have the right kind of foot. It didn't chew the cud. They were not supposed to eat these things. But they, they came in with this pig and they offered this hog on the uh, sow, on the uh, altar in Jerusalem. But they offered this sow to Zeus on the altar of God in the temple in Jerusalem. A total defilement. He forced the Jews. Now remember I said I have a Christmas tree in my house right now. He forced the Jews to celebrate the birthday of King Dionysia. King Dionysia was proclaimed to be the son of Zeus. Every year they had to celebrate his birthday. He was born ready for this? He was born December 25th. Son of Zeus. Born December 25th. I'm getting that from the book of... In, the, in between the Old and New Testaments, there were 14 books that are not in our authorized King James Bible that are called the Apocrypha. One of the books of the Apocrypha is called 1 Maccabees. Chapter 6, verse 4 Verses 7 and 8 of the, uh, of the book of 1 uh, Maccabees is where this story comes from about King uh, Dionysia. In a little town called Modin, there was a man named Matthias Maccabee, a devout man of God. The commander of the Seleucid army from Syria, his name was Apelles, came and uh, came to take over the town. Apelles, rather than coming in with his army and just wiping out the town and killing everybody, he approaches Matthias, who seemed to be kind of, you know, over the town, kind of like mayor of the town. He approaches Matthias and offers him gold, silver, and honor and trade, you know, uh, for just surrender and, uh, and allowing them to take over this, the uh, little town of Modin uh, or else, you know, they could come in and be an all-out war. But they offered him gold, silver, and honor to be the first person, like he's like the mayor, he's spokesperson for the town, to offer a pig sacrifice to Zeus. This devout man of God stood in the face of this general and said, if all the nations that are within the king's domains obey him by for forsaking every one of them the worship of their fathers and have chosen for themselves to follow his commands, yet Will I and my sons and my brethren walk in the covenant of our fathers? Heaven forbid that we should forsake the law, the Torah, and the ordinances for the mitzvah of the, of the, of the word. The law, the, he said, this is what he said, the laws of the king we will not obey by departing from our worship either to the right or to the left. At this point, a young man runs up to uh, Apelles and says, I'll do it, I'll do it, give me the pig, I'll do it. Matthias grabbed him and killed him. War was on. For the next three years, there was terror and horror throughout all the land of Judea. But finally, in the year 165 BCE, B.C., however you want to say it. Finally, in the year 165, before the time that Jesus came, came into the world, Judah's army arrives in Jerusalem to liberate the temple. The Greeks were defeated. The Greeks were ran out of town. But here the temple was in a mess. I mean, they had been having these orgies in the temple, in the house of God, having orgies in there where uh, people are supposed to be coming and bringing their, their, their sacrifices for, I mean, for the uh, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, and everything is supposed to happen here. But the temple is in a mess. It's been defiled. 
Here they had this pig blood all over the brazen altar where they'd been offering pigs to Zeus. So after the Greeks were ran out, the first thing they had to go in, go in and do is start cleaning the house of God.